single payer now to come up and inspire us to continue organizing for SB 810 as a vehicle to move our campaign forward. <laughs> Educate more people, hold our elected officials feet to the fire. So on the back of your agenda is the list of legislators who need to hear from Californians in order for the bill to move to the assembly and ultimately to the governor. I may have to take out another $20 bill. Here to tell us how to do it from someone who has dedicated his life to this movement is none other than my friend, Don Beckley. Thank you, Mary. On the wall. On the wall. It doesn't stick. I had a hard time. Michael's saying put it on the wall, but we had a very hard time. So, so, I'll tell you what. The, so there's some things we can do um, right now to organize to protect our health care. And there's a number of bad things going on. I mean, the 1% of this country wants to destroy our health care and couldn't care less about us. We have to be part of the 99% and be very visible that we want a national health care system minus the uh, insurance companies budding into it. Um, we're seeing, as we speak, we're seeing attacks on Medicare and Medicaid. As we speak, we saw the national health care legislation um, be watered down by taking the long-term care provision out of it about a week and a half ago. Yesterday, one of our, our friends, Walmart, um, <laughs> that employs 1.4 million people, decided to no longer provide health care for people who uh, work under 24 hours a week. Oh, um, I used to have a kind of a crummy program, but it was something. And they also then decided if you work between 24 and 33 hours a week, uh, that you can no longer insure your spouse on their health care program. And the Walmart officials call this a, a balanced approach right. between costs and quality care. <laughs> and if I have health care, I'm not sure where the balance is. <laughs> anyway, so all these things are taking place. So we need to fight back. Legislators need to see we're out there fighting. They need to know that there's wind in their sails, there's people supporting them. So there's a couple things we can do. Um, one, um, here in Sacramento, you got 40, you got, it's in the Senate, you've got 40 senators, there's 25 Democrats, but there's about six or seven of them that are iffy. And um, they're on the back of this list. A lot of these people should be called. Um, so, one, contact your senator. Uh, two, contact Jerry Brown. I think if he was on board with this thing, he could push these senators around. We have some postcards back here if you want to um, contact your um, if Jerry Brown. Um, three, on Monday, the San Francisco Labor Council is hosting a teaching on Medicare and Medicaid and Social Security. Yes. Thank you, Tim Paulson. It's at 7 o'clock at night. Um, Carl Fenimore, get up. Um, he has, he's a, a, a past president of the Machinist Union at the airport. He, he has leaflets. Can you hand those out um, for the meeting on, um, on Monday night? Then on Tuesday, uh, we have another opportunity to, to talk to President Obama. He's coming to town on Tuesday at the W Hotel at 1130, uh, Tuesday morning. That's the corner of 3rd and Howard. And we want to have banners out there that say, Californians want Medicare for all. So how many people can make that? Ten. Okay. Okay, 10, okay. If you come a little early, you got, we have placards and stuff. So we want a big crowd for that. You can sign up over there. Um, and then the last thing I want to, and then we'll probably, I hope, out of the Labor Council meeting, um, decide to take some actions, because the Medicare, the cuts on Medicare report will come out on November 23rd. And after that, we want to be in the streets organizing those cuts. But then on January 9th, the California Association of Professional Health Care Students, I got the words a little mixed up, but you know what I mean. They have this wonderful rally that Henny was talking about on Monday, January 9th. So if you want to go to that, go over here and see Betty or see me after the meeting and sign up to go to that. We want to get a couple of buses that go up there. It's a wonderful rally. It's not organized by the Vermont Worker Center, but it's organized by the students. And we'll have at least 1,000 people up there. And we encourage everybody from around the state to go up there and to, and to, and to mobilize for that. Um, lastly, so we want you to contact your senator, but where did Senator Lowe go? He'll be back.
Well, pretend like he's here. Ah, oh, pretend like he's here. He's okay. here. There it is. Here it is. He's so, right here. So, here. So, so people. So, so we're asking people to contact their senators. So, so people have seen. I feel the contact. So people. So people have seen the Wall Street demonstrations in New York. Yeah. Well, they don't have a microphone. Yeah. Yeah. So I want you to repeat after me. Okay. okay. Repeat after me. Okay. Repeat after me. Okay. Repeat after me. Okay. Um, Senator Leno. Senator Leno. Thank you for sponsor for co-authoring Senate Bill 810. Thank, thank you for co-authoring Senate Bill 810. Please work hard to get through the Senate. Please work hard to get through the Senate. Okay. The faster we can get the private insurance companies out of our lives, the better. <laughs> Senator Leno for being here and hearing us out. Yes. Um, we know that there are a number of Southern California senators who previously were either co-authors 
or supported SBA 10 and have <coughs> drifted away, what can you do and how can we help besides making phone calls, but what can you do to get them back on board and committed to voting yes on 810? Thank you. So the, the question is, can we threaten my colleagues? <laughs> Especially the ones the Democrats from Southern California to get them to vote for single payer That's right. SBA 10. And I would like to say, the question really should be, what can we do? Because I wish I could tell you I could muscle all my colleagues to do exactly what I want them to do. We but have to do that it. That yeah. doesn't always happen. And they very specifically, and this is why names and numbers are on the back of these papers, we need to be in their district offices, not just once, but twice, three times, repeatedly. And hopefully not just three or four people, but 20, 30, 40, 50. They need to know that their constituents back home value this bill very much and that they're not going away. That's really what threatens any elected official, <coughs> that their hometown constituencies really care about something. Because until now, we really haven't been hearing that much. And what they do know, and this is why publicly financed campaigns are so important, what they do know is they need money to run for whatever their next aspiration is, whether it's re-election to their current office or to some step up the political ladder. And it's going to be competitive, and they need more money than the next guy. And that insurance industry is very deep-pocketed. And they know that if they were to assist our efforts in any way, the next time they call that industry to ask for support of their next operation, that they may not get the answer they want. So we need to put pressure on them, yes. We need to do that at the local level in their district offices. Call, make appointments, and get respectfully, always respectfully, respectfully, as Annie says, but be present. And if you can't get in, and you can't get in as often as you like, or you're not getting in and getting the response that you want, do something public on the steps of their office building, whatever it may be. The larger, the better, and of course, get some media attention. Get some media attention, some stories as to why did this senator support this or co-authored this two years ago and suddenly has a change of heart? What's that about? And they may come up with some policy reason, well, because of the Affordable Care Act, we no longer need this, or we don't want to interfere with its implementation. We know there are answers to all those questions. But that's what I would suggest we need to do each in our own part of the state, and if we're all North uh, Bay Areans here today... Find your friends in the South! We've got friends in the South, yeah. Yeah, all, all, all politics is local. Uh, let me go over on this side, Diane Harlech, and I will come back to the side next. One of the things I would really like to hear you speak about, the policy is fine, but given California's budget, what kind of proposals are going to be made for financing this uh, help, uh, health care for all, and how will they interface for seniors with Medicare? So, first and foremost, there are tens of billions of dollars that we would save in the first year alone by just getting rid of the for-profit middleman. Mm. A third of our health care dollar is not spent on any health care delivery oh, at all, God. but on administrative costs for insurance, employee bonuses, and incentives to deny us health care. They get bonuses by denying us health care. You know, when I tell people, let's use our imaginations for a minute. Just imagine the most ill-conceived, <laughs> ill-fated health care system you can even imagine. What if we were to put a for-profit middleman for the health between the health care provider and the health care consumer, a for-profit middleman that provides no health care at all, doesn't build one hospital bed, doesn't do any medical research, doesn't do anything health-related, and in fact makes its many billions of dollars of profit each year by denying us health care. Let's put them in charge of our health care system. That's what we've got. It's completely nonsensical. No one else in the world is doing it, which is why we rank 37th among nations, according to the World Health Organization, and we pay twice per capita to rank 37th. So it's a faulty system. We'd save tens of billions in our first year just in administrative savings alone. 
And then when we bulk purchase our pharmaceuticals and our durable medical equipment, like eyeglasses and hearing aids and wheelchairs, there are, there's another 10 billion to be saved there. And then another six billion or so in focusing on primary and preventive care. So you keep people healthier rather than making them sick. And you add all of that up, and there are major savings, and we begin to contain health care costs. That's how we do it. Now, how we pay for it is through a payroll deduction. Mm -hmm. So those who are employed, not unlike a deduction for Medicare right now or Social Security, a percentage would be taken out and the employer would put something in and it all goes into one big pool. And that would be our affordable health care pool. And access to that pool is not dependent upon employment or salary. It's all that's required is residency in California. So we can cover everybody and do it in a better fashion, more effective, and keep people healthier and save money by doing it in this fashion. The longer we wait, the higher that payroll deduction is going to be. We've done it in 2006 when Sheila Kuehl authored the bill and we did our Lewin Group report. It was going to be in the neighborhood of about... 8%, I think, yeah. now it's for employee and employer, and it's more, it's more now. We, we need to do another study. <coughs> but you still didn't talk about the interface with Medicare. Medicare would go into that yes. pool also. Your Medicare money that now goes to Kaiser for you and Kaiser for me will go into that pool and we'll pay for that. Don't you, I, again, don't you have to get a waiver from yes. that? Yes, yes, we have to get a waiver and that's in the works. That's all done. I need to get one, this lady and her hand up, one more person on this side, 